Could you please open your Bibles? <laughs> Eric's talking about being excited about this passage. It is an exciting passage, and, and I will tell you, it's a challenging passage. Um, it's to Revelation chapter 20, and we're going to be studying today uh, verses 1 through 6. Haven't you been blessed by the preaching of God's word over the last three weeks from Eric and Alan and Hugh? I mean, just, oh my goodness, you guys. Um, I'm just so thankful for God's plan to give local churches a plurality of elders, a plurality of pastors, so that it will never, it's never to be just one, who, it's never to be who is preaching the word, it's it's that the word is being preached. And I'm so thankful for our brothers and their faithfulness to Scripture. So this morning we're going to study the millennium in uh, Revelation 20. What the Bible refers to as the 1,000 year reign of Christ. Um, so I want to highlight something. We devoted a weekend in May to the study um, of, of the millennium and the four eschatological views of the millennium. Um, guys, I, and I, I, I try, I'm not trying to complain or anything. Just, is it ringing out there like it is up here? Yeah. Tell me if you need me to do anything differently. That would be the best sermon. You guys would go, oh, that's a good sermon. We can't hear you. Such a good sermon. <laughs> so we devoted a weekend in May, a Friday and Saturday, to study the four eschatological views. So that would be historical, premillennial, dispensational, premillennial, postmillennial, and amillennial. And so I'm going to encourage you to go to our website if you want to learn more about those views. Um, you need to understand membership here at Sovereign Grace Church does not require you to have to agree with the amillennial view that we've been presenting through Revelation. Uh, our fellowship, guys, and our unity are not based on how Christ will come again, but that, but that Christ will come again. That's, that's our fellowship. That's our unity. I'll never forget uh, Warren Wiersbe. He's a um, writer, author, written a lot of little commentaries. and He was humble. He, he said, you know, I went back and listened. He was an older pastor, and he said, I went back and listened to some of the sermons I preached when I was a young pastor particularly on Revelation and First and Second Thessalonians and just some different passages dealing with the second coming of Christ. And he said, man, you would have thought when I was just this young dude, he said, you would have thought that I was on the organizing committee for Christ's return, that, that I was part of that organizational team. And he says, now that I'm an older pastor, I want you to know I've resigned from the organizing committee and I just want to be on the welcome committee. And I think that, that would be where our hearts would be. So even if you don't agree with, with, with what I'm about to share about the millennium, I do believe that we all, that, it, that, that the, the purpose of God establishing a millennium in regard to how it changes our hearts and motivates us to live for his glory, I think that will transcend your millennial view. And we can all leave here with a good takeaway that would bring God glory and equip us more for mission and ministry for, for, the, for the Lord. So would you read with me um, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be released for a little while. And then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image 
and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Well, Heavenly Father, uh, we always approach this pulpit never feeling sufficient in ourselves to consider anything of value as coming from ourselves. But as your word says, our adequacy is from you. Our adequacy is the inerrant, inspired word of God. And God, we just desire that the original intent that you had for inspiring these six verses of this precious book would be accomplished in the hearts of these precious people. God, please do in us what you, what you originally designed to do to the seven churches, to do for the seven churches of Asia Minor. Because we know that the scriptures can't mean now what they didn't mean then. So please help us, Lord. Please help me. And we ask this for your glory and the godly good of these precious people. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the joys that I've had in spending time with my grand girl, Tatum, is listening to her laugh. And we've been laughing a lot. And often, the, the, when she really laughs hard, there's a familiarity to her laughter that just really gets to me. And it sounds like the laughter of her, her sweet mom, Kelly, our precious daughter-in-law. We could, couldn't ask the Lord for more precious Wives for our husbands and daughter-in-laws for, for us. They feel like they're our own. And Kelly not only has a precious laugh, she often reminds me of the Proverbs 31 woman in that she's able to laugh at the future. You remember that, you remember that phrase? Even if the future appears frightening. I, it's easy for me to laugh at the future as long as I'm thinking about hey, grandson's coming. I can laugh about that future. I'm excited. Or Josh is marrying Alexis in October. I, oh, I'm smiling about that future. Oh my goodness, you guys, there's a lot, lot of things about the future I'm not smiling about. I, I have fears about. I worry about. So what is it? How do you learn to laugh at the future? Well, I'm blessed to be married to a woman who laughs at the future. She also laughs at her husband. Um, and so I, I just started asking myself, well, if Tatum gets her laugh from her mom, where does her mom get her ability to laugh at the future? Where does my precious wife get her ability to laugh at the future, especially if the future's dark, especially if you feel like I have no faith. I barely got to church today. It was hard to get out of bed today. Laugh at the future? I don't even know. I don't, I've even forgotten what, what a belly laugh even feels like. I've been so burned down and weighed down. So, so is it just a personality trait? No, no. Where does Jan, where does Kelly, where does the Proverbs 31 woman get her ability, their ability to laugh at the future? What's well, the same place all of us can get an ability to laugh at the future? from our Heavenly Father. Tatum gets her laugh from her mom. Her mom's ability to laugh at the future, though, it comes from her Heavenly Father. So, can you think of a text where God might teach his people how to laugh? Does the text come to mind? Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Thank you. Yes, Psalm 2. You guys, the Bible talks about the nations raging 
and, and, and coming against God and his anointed Jesus Christ. And God sits on his throne and he laughs, not, not in arrogance, not in some sort of demeaning way at all. He laughs because his sovereignty is in total control over evil, isn't it? Amen? And his sovereignty is in total control of salvation. God's plans cannot be thwarted. And as God considers the future, though he's timeless, he's in all of time, though, though he, but as, as, as we would think of considering the future, God laughs so that whatever you and I are facing, we can laugh at the future too when we're trusting in the one who rules over it all, in the one who reigns over it all. Is that making sense? So I'm, I would almost pray, God, please use this text to teach us to laugh at the future. I think that's actually one of the intentions of this text. God's promised that he is sovereign over all of evil and is even using evil to accomplish his purposes. And he is sovereign over salvation. And, and he wants to give the Christian heart, the Christian soul, great security. So even if the worst should come in dying for our faith, like the song that we sing, it only shortens our journey and hastens us to be with him. I believe that God included the doctrine of the millennium in the Bible to help us laugh at the future. And it's all for these same reasons. The doctrine of the millennium pastored the hearts of those first churches in Asia Minor, those seven churches that really, seven was symbolic of, of meaning that what the Lord was teaching in those seven churches is needed in church history, all of redemptive history. All of God's people need the lessons from the first, the, lesson, the letters to the first seven churches. The, the, guys, we're going to say it just a few more times because we're almost done with Revelation. God gave us this book to pastor our hearts, not to freak us out about all the prophecies that we, don't or we do or don't understand. It's meant to pastor your heart just like it did those first believers in the first century church. Uh, they were faced with temptations to compromise their faith because of seeking satisfactions in the things of this world. You, are you there? You were there this week. I was there this week. Just to consider that something else might be better than obedience to Christ. Something else might be more valuable than following the Lord or being transformed into his likeness. And they faced the constant threat of compromise because of persecution, whether it came from economic sanctions or the threat of lost employment or, or literally being killed for their faith. And what the scriptures meant for them, it means to us too. It means to us too. So may God pastor our hearts this morning the way he pastored the first century church with this text. So here's the main point. This should be in your notes. God gave us the millennium to motivate us to fearlessness in missions because he has assured us of the joyful security of our souls forever. And I, I hope you saw that even just in the reading of the text. And let's see if we can unpack it so that we can try to see that even more clearly. The first point is simple. It's just coming out of the main point. The millennium motivates fearlessness in missions. And you see that in the first three verses of Revelation 20. So let's start getting some categories of this millennium period. We know that the millennium takes place before Christ's second coming. So here's what, I didn't read this verse. We're going to cover this next week. But would you, would you fix your eyes on verse 7? Because this gives us some parameters here about the millennium. And verse 7 says, And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are on the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. So we'll unpack that uh, more next week. But, but for this morning's purposes we see that the millennium takes place before Christ's second coming to make all things new, to bring the new heavens and new earth. It happens before Christ's second coming. 
So then the next question should be, okay, when did it start, right? So if we're seeing that, it's, it's, that it, it ends with the second coming of Christ, when, when did the millennium start? I think that would be helpful for us to know. And our text gives us a lot of clues about that. Our text tells us that it began when Satan was bound by the great angel and was thrown down into the abyss for a thousand years. Okay, so then you ought to be asking, okay, so when was that, right? And that's, that's good. That's, what we ought to be, that's how we ought to be thinking and pondering the text. If we read Revelation chronologically, it would be easy to think that the coming, the, that coming out of Revelation 19, and Alan, if you, haven't, if you haven't heard Alan's sermon on Revelation 19, the, the, the last half of the book, it's on final judgment. It, the, it, 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 it's all judgment all the time in that text. And I listened to it when, when we were gone, and I'm just going, I have never been so hope-filled about God's rule over the earth than, than listening to Alan preach. It was a magnificent, soul-stirring sermon, and I encourage you to go see, go listen to that. It might help you better understand where I'm coming from in, in coming into chapter 20. Um, so if, if, we're, um, if we're just reading Revelation chronologically, which we have not, right? So if you've been in the Revelation for a long time with me, um, we've learned that this book is not written chronologically. It's a, it's a book of symbols and signs. It, it, it's, it's, there's a theological flow to the book, to be sure, and, and symbols and signs don't remove any of the literalness of the truth that it's communicating. Um, but it's, it's a, re remember we've used the word, it's a recapitulation. Oh my goodness, so you're gonna, you guys are going to go, okay, we're going to be here in Billy talk about grandparenting stories for a while. Um, so it's amazing, you know, having little grandkids, uh, how what you watch changes. <laughs> and so, so I've never seen a movie called Despicable Me. Anybody seen? Oh, <laughs> oh man. Okay, let's talk after service because I want to pray for you. Um, <laughs> You guys know I love you to pieces. I love you to pieces. So Despicable Me, a very interesting thing that I never knew about. Because I'm getting really, I'm kind of going, I don't even know if I want to watch this. I mean, am I watching this? Who is this guy? He's really yucky and bleh. But then as you see the movie unfold, it's not, it doesn't always stay chronological. There's some, but then it goes back to what? When he was little guy, right? And it shows him trying to please his mom. And so here he is, mom, here's, I can't remember all the, all the things he was saying. Here's a, here's a rocket ship made out of macaroni and cheese, you know? And the mom just goes, eh. Oh, I got started getting mad at the mom, man. And, but you start to see, it's, it's not just this chronological flow. There, it goes back to historical moments that are important to get a grasp of in order to understand the big picture, right? So if we can get that out of Despicable Me, we can certainly then understand how the Lord would use that in the text of Scripture. And I'll, I'll give you some more information on that in just a minute. So it's, it's, Revelation, I think a lot of big mistakes take place if you try to read Revelation chronologically. Um, re, it, it, for instance, coming out of Revelation 19, there's the picture of the final battle and final judgment and that's, that um, if Satan was bound following the end of this battle, well, what use is that? All evil has already been... So wait a minute, we're going to bind Satan and there's no other... Remember what the text says. That, that Satan was bound in order to not deceive the nations any longer. Well, chapter 19 just said what? There ain't no nations left. There aren't any kings that are ruling in all their evil ways. The beast and the false prophet, all of them. Go, go back and look at Revelation 19. They're all gone. So then go into chapter 20 and you say, okay, so the devil's bound until then and Wait, why would, wait, or, no, that he would be bound then? Why would he be bound then? It makes absolutely no sense. There's no one left to deceive. The only thing remaining is the coming of Jesus to establish the new heavens and the new earth. That's what's happening there. 
as we learn, Revelation, uh, we've seen this in other, in other parts of Revelation. In Revelation 9, in the trumpet judgments, you'll see a final battle. You see it in the end of Revelation 16, in the bold judgments. Uh, there's a final battle. We saw it in chapter 19 last week, a final battle. We're going to see it next week in, in verses 7 through 15 of chapter 20, a final battle. You see what the Lord is doing? He's saying, I, I, want, I want you to look at what I'm doing in my sovereignty over evil and wanting to embolden you to reach the world with the gospel. I want you to see what I'm doing. I'm, I'm sovereign over every evil thought and deed of Satan. I'm sovereign over every evil world ruler. I want you to see that. I want you to see that there is going to be justice. That, that, that there will be a final judgment which will not allow any evil to have triumphed in the earth. No wrong done. There, there, there won't be anything that has been perpetrated on earth that won't be paid for in full in, in the final judgment. So what's going on here? Well, God has been showing us through those different camera angles that there does tend to be a different, a growing intensity of the judgment. And you kind of even get a sense of that. When did you notice how, how uh, the John unpacked, he didn't just use Satan, he used Satan, serpent, deceiver. I, he, he just is unpacking, this is the most evil that evil can get. And God laughs. And God laughs. Because he's in total control of what's happening here. So if the binding of Satan did not place, take place at the end of the final judgment, when did it take place? Well, God not only, uh, God not only uh, does want, he, he wants to encourage the hearts of his people with his sovereignty over evil, but he's also wanting to inspire and motivate us about his sovereignty and salvation and his unstoppable plan to save people from every people group on earth. So this vision in Revelation 20, 1 through 3 regarding the binding of Satan reaches back in time to focus on a specific moment in salvation history. So there's this recapitulation of salvation history, and it's going to really start to give us a sense of, oh, okay, I'm starting to see it. If the millennium ends at the second coming of Jesus... I think what we're going to find in the text is the millennium began at the first coming of Jesus. Let's see if the text says that. Um, when was Satan bound? Well, he began to be chained during the ministry of Christ. And the abyss was sealed through his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. So I'm just, I gave you a scripture text this morning. I didn't quote other authors today. I just thought, you know what? Let's, I'm just going to give you scripture references today. Um, so let's look at Mark 3.23. Jesus is debating the teachers of the law, and they're accusing him of being, a, a, of being addressed by demons, by, ruled by demons, that, that the work he's doing is being empowered by demons. And you remember his response. You can read it there in your notes. Um, and he called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then, indeed, he may plunder their house. Well, the word for ties up in verse 27 is the same word that Revelation uses as the word bound. So Jesus is understanding that Satan was already in the process of being chained, even just in his earthly ministry, prior to his crucifixion. Why do I say that? Well, let's look at Luke 10. Jesus has sent out, remember, he sent out 72 disciples to preach the kingdom and do signs and wonders. And they returned to Jesus saying, the 72 returned with joy. So this is the, the text. Saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. 
The word fall is the same as in Revelation 12, when the great dragon was cast down from heaven. So, so there again, in the ministry of Jesus, you're starting to see that, that Satan's ability to deceive is being confined and restrained already. But it's really going to come clear here in John 12. John 12, verses 31 through 33. Listen to what Jesus says. Now is the judgment of this world. Remember, he, he, kept, he had to keep telling them, it's not my hour. It's not my hour. It's not my hour. Now he's saying, it's the hour. It's the hour. And what's happening now? Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Being lifted up on the cross is what he was referring to. Essentially, he's saying, in my ministry, my death and resurrection the prince of this world will be driven out. The word cast out in that text is the same used in Revelation 20, verse 3, when it says Satan was thrown down into the abyss. Verse 32, Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He's not talking about universal salvation, but salvation of peoples from all people groups on earth. And it sounds just like Revelation 20, verse 3. The purpose of binding Satan is that so he can no longer deceive the nations. Look what Jesus is saying. He's, he's being cast down. Why? Because in my being lifted up on the cross, I'm going to draw all peoples of all people groups. I'm going to save souls from all people groups in the world. Nothing can stop it. Because Satan has been bound so that the gospel could go into all parts of the world. The millennium, precious ones, is the age of the triumph of the gospel that will win souls from every tongue, tribe, race, and nation. And it was inaugurated by Christ in his death, in his resurrection, in his ascension. And it will be concluded once the Great Commission is completed. Guys, have you ever... I had to stop and kind of just think and kind of take, call my heart to attention. Do you sometimes wonder if the Great Commission will be fulfilled? Is that ever just kind of a doubt that goes through your mind, just thinking, gosh, there's, there are so many people groups that haven't been reached yet. And, and so many of them are in the hardest of places, whether, whether uh, geographically hard or militantly hard because if you go there you're likely to lose your life as a witness for Jesus do you ever sometimes wonder could the great commission be finished well of course it can but that's what Jesus is saying here the reason it's going to be finished is because I'm doing something dramatic at the cross. This is what, what breaks my heart. So oftentimes when I've heard Revelation preached in the past, the cross was hardly mentioned in this book. The cross is all over this book. The centrality of Jesus is all over this book. And it's his crucifixion that, that caused Satan to be bound in regard to deceiving the nations. So it's this mass deception that would cause all the nations to, to combine their forces. Here's what we're going to do. All of us, whether communist or, or Islam or agnostic or atheist or whatever, here's what we're going to do. We so hate God and we so hate the people of God. We are going to put our forces together and in one fell, well, what's the word? One fell swoop. <laughs> swoop is wimpy sounding. In one fell blow. blow. Thank you. We're going to put an end to the church. Why hasn't that happened, guys? Because Satan is bound from that being allowed to happen. Now, next week, come back next week, and you're going to see at the very end, before Christ comes to establish the new heavens and new earth, there's going to be this releasing and this, this antagonistic effort on his part. And it's... <laughs> God is going to destroy him by the breath of his mouth. But the 
reason we should have boldness to reach people is because he has been bound from deceiving people and he's been bound to prevent the gospel from going into all people groups. That's what he's been bound for. Can he still lie? Yes. Listen, just don't, so you're, I think that's where it's kind of a mind blower for people to think, well, why, man, sure doesn't seem bound, but he sure seems active in my life. You know, oh man, you know, he seems to be attacking me right and left. Yeah, of course. Because he's not bound in those areas. Think about this. So I'm bound in covenant to my wife, but I still have relationships. I have, I have brothers that I'm in relationship with, sisters that I'm in relationship with. I have business relationships with people. I, I, I'm a dad to sons. I'm a papa to Tatum and Adeline and Liam. And, I, and so, so I'm bound in a unique way. But there's still an ability in my life to relate and to have activities in other ways, right? Well, that's the same thing. Think of your business transactions. You, if you're buying a house, you have an, a certain amount of your income that is bound, isn't it? <laughs> it's bound. And it seems like it's forever bound. But does that mean that that's all of your income? That your entirety of income is bound? No, you still have other income that you use for other reasons. Satan has been bound in the unique sense that the nations can't combine their forces to just try to destroy the church. And, the, and because of that, the gospel can reach all people groups. Are you with me? The millennium is the triumph of the gospel to all parts of the world. That's what this is about. And you and I should take from that that there is no, and listen, how many of you have been tempted to give up just even on family members? My, my, my dad or my uncle or my cousin or my boss or my next door neighbor, I just don't know that there's ever any softening for their heart. Not according to John 12. If I be lifted up, I'm giving authority for the gospel to go and touch every heart. And the elect will be saved. The elect will be saved. It's a tremendous victory verse. And so that's why we, we see the millennium as starting with the first coming of Christ and ending at the second coming of Christ. It's not that Satan can't do anything. It's just that he cannot keep the gospel from reaching all people groups. And why? Because God's sending. Have you gone, let me just, listen, if, you, if you, you and I could have a cup of coffee kind of a question, how many times in 2022 have you shared the gospel with people? And listen, I'm no, I'm no gospel champion. I'm no gospel sharing champion. Uh, it's, when I consider that, I think, oh, Lord, forgive me for being so silent about this when you paid the highest price for the gospel to reach all kinds of people in all kinds of places. Don't put your trust in your ability to share the gospel. Put your trust in what God has done to, to pave the pathway for the gospel to go to all peoples. That's what this millennium is about. It's not about for us to... And so listen, and like I said, you may shake out differently on interpreting the millennium. But I think we can agree that God has done something so that the gospel can reach all people groups. Amen? Amen. We can agree on that. Well, shouldn't this stir us and embolden us to be courageous and maybe to, whether it's going to a hard nation or whether it's going to a hard neighbor or whether it's going to a hard niece or nephew. I don't know where the, the place is that God wants to send you, but let's go with confidence that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Let's go with that confidence, guys, not confidence in us and our personality or our, our talkativeness or whatever. God, God loves to use quiet people to share an explosive gospel. And so I think that's what's happening here. Yeah, but it says a, a thousand years. It's been more than a thousand years, Billy, since Jesus. If, if, if it's between his first and second coming, woo, danger, I think you really blew it there, you know. Yeah, if you see the guy, a thousand years is literal. I don't believe that it's literal. What number have we studied in Revelation? 
that has been literal. 144,000, was that literal? The 1,260 days, the time, times, and half a times. The twelves in the, that we've seen in the book, the sevens, the fours, the threes, 200 million mounted troops. These numbers are symbolic of literal truth and principle and theology that they're communicating. But, but very few people in all four of those, those different camps interpret everything in Revelation as literal. Much is not. The symbols are not literal. Is there a literal dragon? Is there a literal beast? Is there a literal false prophet? Is there a little pro literal prostitute named Babylon riding on some horse somewhere? Is, is, there, is there a literal eating of a scroll? Is there a literal seven heads and ten horns? Is there a literal sword in Christ's mouth? Is there literally blood as high as horses' bridles for 200 miles? Oh, precious ones, though they're symbolic, they point to literal theological truths. The thousand years, you, if you go back and you look at the way numbers were handled over, over history, seven, sacred number, we've seen that. Three, another sacred number, and both speak of a sense of completion. So the ten was significant. And the ten being cubed, so here we go again, it's essentially saying that, man, ten is, is, is divinely achieved order and completion and perfection. You cube ten and it's just magnifying the perfection of God for that time period. So what, what, what can we glean from that? If it's not a literal thousand years, what is it? It's the perfect amount of time for us to reach all nations. That's what it is. Isn't it, isn't it going to be that once the last soul is one from a people group, isn't that when the end's going to come? Right? Remember? That's when the end's going to come, is when the gospel's gone to all people groups, and there is a witness from each people group that will be gathered around the throne for eternity. Wow, that's going to be awesome. Oh, that's going to be awesome. So that's what it's about. It's about a perfect time frame for the Great Commission to be completed. Thank you, Jesus. These verses just, guys, they weren't given for us to argue about the millennium. They're given to inspire us and remind us that we're a part of a glorious and unstoppable mission. When God saved you, he didn't just give you this personal and private salvation. He saved you to sweep you up into this glorious cause. How many of us are living because we have, this, we have a reason for getting out of bed, guys? We have a reason for making sacrifices and taking up our cross daily and following him. He didn't save us just so that we could have a little easy trip to heaven. He saved us so that we could hopefully take other people with us. This is the good news of the gospel. I got really excited there, didn't I? <laughs> I, I get excited because I forget that. I get excited because so much of my life with God can just be about, oh God, please help me here. Please bless me here. Please help me here. Please bless me here. And I have, I have very little regard of being caught up into this glorious, great commission to see people saved from all over the world. That's why he saved us. And that's the purpose, I think, of the, the doctrine of the millennium, is to remind us of that. What a privilege we have to live in this time of redemptive history where God is calling his elect from all corners of the earth through the gospel. It should inspire courage in us and endurance and compassion and willingness to go wherever it's hard. And then suddenly we go from that. We, so we see God's sovereignty over evil, binding Satan from deceiving the nation so that they might do this power play against the church. Why? So that the gospel could go to all people groups. So we see that. And what's the other reason? So that God can give you assurance that even if you had to pay the highest price, that you had to die for your faith in taking the gospel to all people groups. Oh, there's great security for your soul. 
and it's a joyful security. And that's the second part of this. Because the scene changes from seeing, seeing Satan bound in an abyss to, to allow the gospel to go to all peoples. And then the scene changes. And now it's a scene. It's almost like, I, I can't imagine what, what John was seeing. But it just, it's not hard to imagine that he's seeing Satan thrown down into this abyss, chained and sealed into this abyss to be prevented from hindering the gospel advancement. But he's also kind of noticing heaven still. And he looks up to heaven and he sees thrones. Well, we know there's one premier throne, chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation. It's the theological center of the book. Remember, that's where Jesus was on his throne, ruling and reigning. The lamb that was slain from before the foundations of the world. Ruling and reigning. But these are thrones. Who is sitting on them? Would any of you dare to say, we are? Would you dare to say? Let's dig, let's dig into that a little bit. How do we understand in verse 4 when it says, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years? Well, he's looking into heaven. We see thrones. It speaks of royalty. And this is where I think you could really say, this is where king's kids sit in heaven. Who are the people sitting on the thrones? Revelation uses the word the throne more than 40 times. And 40 times is each time the throne is referring to heaven. So when it's talking about reigning, right? Reigning with Christ. It's talking about what's going on in heaven while the gospel is advancing throughout the earth. It's not talking about this thousand-year period where Jesus has come literally and, the, and now there's... It gets really confusing, guys, doesn't it? That there's, there's, there's resurrected Christians walking around with unbelievers walking around who don't have glorified bodies, who, who, who are still... There's a lot of confusion in a lot of that stuff. And we see that these thrones are the joyful security of our soul when we die. While we are with the Lord, ruling and reigning with him, waiting for the new creation to come, for the resurrection of our bodies to come, and we spend eternity on the new heavens and new earth. So that's what's happening here. Revelation 4, is God is on the throne, we know that. We've seen earlier in Revelation there are 24 thrones, and that represents Christ's people both in the Old Testament and New Testament. So that's what it's referring to, not just individual people, but this is every believer, those who put their faith in the coming of the Messiah and those like us who have put our faith in the Messiah who's already come. That's who these thrones are for. Now let's look a little bit further. Sitting on these thrones in the court of King Jesus really are all who have trusted in him as Lord and Savior. When you think of dying... And I think I've really done a bad job here as, as one of your pastors. I think I talk to you a lot about, oh, wouldn't it be great? You won't hurt anymore. Oh, and that will be great. <laughs> no, we're not going to say it's not. There won't be any more tears. There won't be any more cancer. There won't be any. But I've said very little to you about what the scripture says. About that you'll not only be healed. You'll be reigning with Jesus. He'll be treating you as a king's kid. There's going to be a throne that's waiting with your name on it. Let's go a little bit deeper. The text says John saw souls. Isn't that interesting? It says he saw souls. So the text tells us that the physical resurrection of the believer and the unbeliever hasn't happened yet. He saw souls of those who have been beheaded. For the testimony of Jesus and the word of God. So he's looking at disembodied souls. I have no idea what that's like. But there, there apparently is this fullness of, of ability to think and feel and love and praise and worship. Waiting for the, your resurrected body to come at the end. So he's seeing souls. And then, guys, I don't know about you, if you're old enough to remember. It was in 2015. Do you remember the believers? Do you remember it was one of the Islamic groups who paraded a group of 15, 20 
believers. Remember the orange jumpsuits? Do you remember them? They, they brought them by, I don't know what, if it was some sea or some lake. And they all bent down. They put black hoods over their heads. They had them bow their heads. And one by one, their heads came off. Man, you know, the world could go, what a wasted life. What a loser. What a loser. Until we see this scene. And the moment they breathe their last breath, they're sitting on a throne with Jesus for eternity. Christ is the key throne, right? This isn't any pompous thing going on here. Remember what's going to happen in heaven. We'll get, we'll get this crown. What are we going to do with it? We're going to throw it down. Because when we see him for who he is, oh, how we're going to want to, every fabric in our being is going to want to worship him. Oh, you're worthy. I, I knew you were worthy in my, in intellectually and biblically while I was on that side of heaven. But now that I see you, oh, I want to live for you. I want to give every fabric of my being to worshiping you. Oh, the, the, the Lord vindicates his people. Evil will not win. You will not die a loser because you follow Jesus. But it wasn't just those who were literally martyred. That's the narrow definition here. But the scriptures also go further. I owe you such an apology. I had my watch upside down. And I thought it was 20 to 12. Okay. Wow. But this says I've just been preaching 46 minutes. That's what's freaking me out. I'm going, oh, this is great. If you're visiting today, sorry. Um, it's not a literal hour. <laughs> oh, that was great. And I deserved it, too. That was really... Oh, so good. But it also says it's, it's, that it's those who've overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and not loving their lives unto death. It's those who have, have trusted in Jesus regardless of the hardships, not, not, not taking the mark of the beast, which we know is just simply essentially affirming the fact that I'm dead in my sin and transgression. It's not, it's not that I'm a saved person and I take the mark of the beast and now I'm lost. No, you're already dead in sin. You take the mark of the beast because, yeah, no, I'll, listen, I'll worship everything in the world to, it, to make my life easier so that I can get something for nothing. So that's what that's about. These believers, they overcame threats and persecution. And it wasn't just physical martyrdom. It was that you said no to sin. It's that you said yes to Jesus. And there's a throne for you with him. When you breathe your last breath, you'll be sitting on that throne. Um, you've, you've seen the evidences. Of, so you can look at your notes. Philippians 1, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. That was Paul's longing. I, I, I'm hard pressed. I want to I serve you well, but oh, but my desire is to be with the Lord. So we're always of good courage. Second Corinthians 5, we know that while we're at home in the body, we're away. In the body, we're away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Uh, same thing in 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. The saying is trustworthy, for if we've died with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. So this is talking about the first resurrection. It's not the physical resurrection. It's that because of your salvation, you were raised into eternal life, even though it was in the, at the soul level. You haven't received your glorified body yet. That will come when Jesus brings in the new heavens and the new earth. The thing I want to close with is this. Did you notice the word blessed was used? Blessed are they who have experienced the first resurrection. That means salvation. Blessed are they. Happy are they. How could we frown when, when God is bound evil from keeping the gospel to go into all parts of the world, reaching all kinds of peoples, 
And that we have this assurance of eternal joy with him because of the, Christ, the price Christ paid. How could we frown? Let's stand. Let's stand. I just, I just want you to think about who is the last Christian you knew that died? Uh, somebody you knew well is a Christian and they died. They are not now just feeling better. Oh, you guys, heaven is so much better. The new, the new heavens and new earth is going to be so much better. There's a court where all the believers are seated and God is conducting court with them. And he's talking about his, the wisdom of his decisions and, and people are affirming it and they're participating with it. You saw last week in Alan's text or in, two weeks ago in his text where Jesus is coming to bring final judgment and the saints are on horses riding behind him. That, that we're going to be a part of God's plan You've heard of, of the, the creation mandate, the dominion mandate. When God brings in the new heaven and the new earth, there's going to be good gospel work to be doing, just good work to be bringing God glory and praise and honor. Oh, my goodness, guys. It's not going to be, I'm just going to feel better in heaven. I'm going to be living for the purpose I always would have dreamed of living for if I could have seen all of that right now oh heavenly father so much to have to try to cram in uh, to a little time and lord um, lord things that I didn't relate clearly could you bring clarity to the precious hearts of these precious people God one thing that resonates from these passages is that the millennium was given to motivate missions and to be willing to go to the hardest places because you've paid the pathway for that. And evil cannot stop your plan for gospel expansion. And Lord, also for people who worry about their lives, God, would you give them assurance of a joyful eternity that awaits them regardless of the price we might have to pay here on earth? Please, oh Lord. Oh, to be happy in Jesus. Help us to trust and obey what we're learning today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The Lord bless you and keep you, everybody.